Please stand with me as we read from the 14th chapter of Luke, beginning in verse 12. Jesus also said to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this simple word this morning. As we delve into it, we pray that you will make it clear, that we will understand, and that we will as you direct us, apply it to our lives. Thank you again for the wonder of who you are, Father. And we pray that we will see you in a unique way this morning again. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I should say, by the way, uh, welcome to all of you who are new with us perhaps this morning. And I need to recognize the visitors on the front row here. These are all of our children and uh, one and a half of our grandchildren, uh, one of whom has disappeared here, but uh, we are always privileged when they are here. We thank you for uh, the efforts that you've all made to, uh, to be here. So with that, we're in Luke chapter 14, and in these verses, there's a, uh, there's a great story that went around about George Gershwin for years, the old composer, you know, that he, along with his brother, used to write these Broadway tunes and shows and so on. He gave a party once where he was uh, featuring his music. His music was being played (coughs) throughout this party. And Groucho Marx, the uh, famous comedian, was there as well. Someone asked Groucho, do you think Gershwin's Gershwin's tunes will still be played 100 years from now? And Groucho replied, well, if George is around to play them, they'll still be played which of course is exactly the point that Jesus is making in this text. He's teaching us that there are two ways to live. We can live serving self or we can live serving others. And his point is, if we live to serve self, our efforts will last only as long as we do. But if we are living for others, and if we are serving others, re- re- reward, eternal reward attaches to that. That is the message of this passage. And it's that simple, and I'd say, let's go home, but I know you'd be disappointed if we didn't flesh it out a little bit, so let's do that. This, the setting, of course, is this, is this invitation that Jesus has had to dinner from one of the Pharisees. And so they, he is gone, but it turns out it's a setup. It's not really a friendly invitation they have included in this dinner party, a man who is crippled and who has this dropsy that attaches to him because they want to see if Jesus will heal him so they can accuse him of breaking their Sabbath laws, which in fact is exactly what happens. But Jesus turns it all around on them and points out the hypocrisy of their ways points out that they would willingly get a child or even an animal out of a ditch or out of a well when it would fall in at the, at the expense of great labor on the Sabbath. They give themselves waivers, even though they are objecting to Jesus healing this man with virtually no labor at all expended on the Sabbath. And so he's, he's pointing out their hypocrisy. Now, why does Jesus do this? Jesus does this constantly, beloved, for the same reason that he always is dealing with people. He's trying to bring them to repentance. He's trying to bring them to see the error of their way and the rightness of God's way. That's always what he's about. And now he continues. He's taught them a, a, another parable on humility. And now in this passage we're going to see today, he's going to try and, try and show us again. He's, he's not done. He's going to use a simple dinner party to make the point that that the, of, the, of the hypocrisy that attaches to these people in the hopes that they will turn their lives around. And the point he makes in this introduction, because verses 12 through 14 are really an introduction to what's going to follow, 
The point of the introduction is that advancement into God's kingdom and within God's kingdom comes not through self-promotion, but through serving, through being genuinely interested in others and contributing to their lives. And he does this by means of kind of three simple points here. He tells us what not to do, the prohibition, tells us what to do, the prescription, and he tells us why, the promise. So let's look at those beginning with the prohibition in verse 12. The prohibition is simply don't serve selfishly. Look at the verse. He says also to the man who had invited him. Jesus was never shy about telling the truth, right? This guy's invited him to dinner, but he turns to him and he says, when you give a dinner party, by the way, do not invite your friends and your brothers and your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. So it's a prohibition. It's a prohibition. Is it a prohibition against having friends over for dinner? That's what it sounds like on the surface, right? But that's not what Jesus is getting at. We, we, you have to go a little deeper than that. Jesus is using this simple social occasion to teach a much deeper, much more important truth. The key is the last phrase when he says, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. He's not objecting here, beloved, to a meal between friends that results in another meal between friends, but he's, re he's objecting to the calculating attitude and lifestyle that only does for others to get back in return. If that's the only reason that you're doing something, then you need to check who you are. It doesn't matter whether the event's a dinner party aimed at getting you know, a return invitation to dinner from somebody who cooks better than you do or just so you don't have to cook, whatever. It doesn't matter what's that occasion, whether it's, whether, whether it's helping with a political campaign in the hopes that you're gonna get you know, elevated and get some job out of this, whether it's helping someone you know, contributing to a hospital wing so you can get your name on the plaque, whatever it is, giving a loan at an exaggerated interest rate, whatever it is that you're doing so that you can get back in return, that's what Jesus is objecting to here. This is the person that he has in mind is the person who has, has nothing that they're thinking about except how they can, how they can get for themselves. They don't, they don't do anything. They don't serve anybody without an angle. They're always looking for the edge. Personal gain is their aim. They serve only with an eye to reciprocation. This is the kind of behavior that Jesus is objecting to here and he, because he knows it's rife among the Pharisees. It's rife among them with respect to their social engagements. It's rife among them with respect to their relationship to God. They do only with the expectation that they will earn something in return. This was their basic attitude. They were happy to invite friends over in order to advance their own political or religious cause. They wanted to be seen only with the best people. They didn't mind doing for others as long as there was something in it for them. They represent people who are always looking for a return, whether it's an invitation to dinner, volunteering to a contribution, a cause, whatever it may be. Even can be something religious, something that we do with relative to the church. It's an attitude that easily invades the church. Hopefully we're true believers in Christ that are here today. Now, if not, then the issue is even deeper than that. The issue is how do we get into the kingdom in the first place? Do we, can we buy our way in? Can we earn our way in? This is why he's trying to teach the Pharisees that, because we're all born as Pharisees at heart, right? That's who we are by nature. This is the natural reaction. But Jesus' point is, Self, selfless service, service not aimed at advancement, but service truly aimed at, at, at helping someone else or even truly aimed at serving for God, but not with the expectation of something in return, that he's gonna make us rich, that he's gonna have to give us eternal life. 
We're, by, we're like the old poem when we do that. He, he dropped a penny in the plate and meekly raised his eyes. Glad the week's rent was duly paid for mansions in the sky. Sometimes that's the way we are. We come and we give in the expectation, okay, God now owes me. Don't work that way, beloved. God will never owe us anything. <laughs> our salvation will always depend on his grace, not on our goodness. But here's someone who thinks he can put even God under obligation by service, and that's the attitude God is condemning here. Our service must not be with the prospect of using others to further our agenda. We must not be like the, like the woman who complained to her friend. You know, she said, my husband and I, we just, seems like all we do is fight anymore. Just one fight after another. She said, I've been so upset lately, I've lost 20 pounds. Her friend said to her, well, if it's that bad, why don't, you, why don't you just leave? And her friend said, well, I will, but I'd really like, really like to lose another 15 pounds before I get out, right? That's using others. So often we're like that. Serving only for some benefit, some personal gain that we can get out of it. It's hypocritical. It's manipulative. It's the way we're born. It's unnatural what the Lord is asking us to do. It can only be done as we begin to turn our life over to him and let him live through us. So Jesus isn't asking something that he won't contribute to. He's not asking something that he won't partner with us in. He's not asking something that will not take his grace in our life. He knows that. But he said, I want you to be different. Kingdom people are different. You want to see an example of the other side of this, it's in this, the eighth chapter of Acts. So if you're in Luke, just go to John and then Acts, and you're there. Acts chapter 8. There is, um, this is in the early days of the church, right? After Jesus has gone back to heaven, been resurrected, gone back to heaven, the disciples have begun to preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the death and resurrection, and the church is growing. And it's grown so much now that it's spread from Judea down in southern Palestine to Samaria, to central Palestine. You remember how the Jews hated the Samaritans. Worst kind of racial and ethnic hatred was going on between those people. But now the gospel has gone there. And the gospel has begun to change the Samaritans. And a great revival has broken out in Samaria under the preaching of one of the deacons from the church in Jerusalem, this man named Philip. And it's been great, and the preaching has been great, and the people have responded, and people are coming to faith in Christ. And so now let's pick up in, and among those, by the way, was a, a guy that was a magician named Simon. He was like a modern day, uh, I don't know, pen and teller. Uh, I, don't, I don't know who the modern day guys are. I'm a little behind the times. But whoever you can think of that's a great magician, David Copperfield, he's behind the times too. And I don't know who the great ones are now, but somebody like that. And he made his living by going around and, 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 and amazing people with the tricks that he would do. And he supposedly is one who has come to faith in Christ now. As Philip's been preaching, he's been part of the experience, and he said, I think I, I want that. But after Peter and John hear what's going on in Samaria under Peter's preaching, they come up there to see what's going on as well. Now, this is interesting, because if you remember earlier in, in Jesus' ministry, John at one point wanted to call down fire from heaven on the Samaritans. Do you remember that? And here he is now recognizing, oh, this is much better what Jesus is doing. He's causing people to come to faith in Christ. And so John and Peter go up there and they laid their hands on the new believers, it says, and they received the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? That I thought when we became Christians that immediately the Holy Spirit indwells us and that's true. The, the Bible teaches that clearly. But in these early days, God was making clear that what happened to the Jews in Jerusalem was also happening to the Samaritans in Samaria and later to the Gentiles in Caesarea Philippi by having this same manifestation as the Holy Spirit came upon these people, they would come just like they did on the day of Pentecost with manifestations of fire and with the speaking in, in, in tongues of other languages that these people didn't normally know. And when Peter and John came, this is what happened. So now let's pick up in, in verse 18 of Acts 8. 
It says, now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. <laughs> he wants a new trick. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. In other words, Simon hoped to advance his magician's career with this new approach. Peter goes on and he says, You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right with God. You may have made a confession outwardly, and you may have gone through the motions of a prayer or whatever you did, Simon. You may have thought you were a believer in Christ, but God who sees your heart sees no change. He sees the same old Simon. Your heart is not right before God, Peter says. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. You're just trying to use God. Just like Jesus is saying to the disciples, you're trying to use others. Service aimed at personal gain is not what we are about as believers or what Jesus is about, and it's not the way into the kingdom of God. So the prohibition, don't serve just with yourself in mind. Back in Luke chapter 14, what's the prescription then? The prescription, selfless service. Selfless service is the prescription that Jesus gives in verse 13. But when you give a feast... Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Now keep in mind that as we've looked, as we've seen before, the, the theology of the Pharisees was this. They believed that if you had any of those disabling conditions, it was because of some sin in your life and they absolutely did everything they could not to be around these people. They avoided them. They took pains to go on the other side of the road, whatever they had to do, not to, not to touch sinners because they were above all that. That's the way they lived. So this, these kind of people would never have been invited to their parties. But we have to recognize once again, Jesus is not just giving advice about dinner parties, right? He didn't come from heaven to give advice about dinner parties and banquets. He's making a point. Although Frankly, feeding the poor, helping the blind, being conscious of those who don't have what we have is certainly the right place to start when it comes to serving others and serving God, isn't it? But, but what he's aiming at here is a lifestyle in general, not just one aspect of it, not just who we feed, who happens to be at our table. Jesus is teaching that we are here to give. That's why we exist we are to reflect the glory of God according to Isaiah 43, 6 and 7. That's why we were made in the first place. And the glory of God recognizes these people. He wants us to give and to live not just for, for others, not just for ourselves. Like the passage we read in Philippians this morning. It says, think about the things of others, not just your own. He doesn't say, don't think about your own. But he says in that Philippians passage, consider others more important than you. That's abnormal. We don't do that naturally, do we? And yet God is saying, that's what I want to see out of my people. And Jesus is addressing this to his host because he knows that he never did anything that wasn't calculated for his advantage and to his benefit, including trying to buy his way into heaven with his good works and Jesus is calling him out. Jesus in the same way is calling us out. In a, in a way, what Jesus is saying here, if you think about it, it's no different than what he says in Matthew 12, or, I'm sorry, Matthew 22, verse 37. It's a passage you're, you're very familiar with where somebody asked Jesus to summarize the law. And he said, sure, what is the law? The law is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. He says, you get those two right, and you're in. You just love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. You love your neighbor as yourself. You don't have to worry about the rest of them. The rest of the rules fall by the wayside because they're all included under that. 
Here's the, pro the problem is, it's not easy to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, is it? And it's not easy to love your neighbor as yourself. We're born selfish. Surely we all recognize that. What's the first words the little kids learn, right? You, you all have grandchildren or children, right? The first word they learn is mama, maybe, and dada. And the third one is mine, right? And sometimes it comes before the other two. Mine. Why? Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately ill, right? We are naturally selfish, self-centered. It's only natural that we are more about me than we are about thee. But Jesus is challenging us here. He's saying, listen, if you want to follow me into the kingdom of God, then me has to take a back seat. I want to see that from your heart you can serve those who are poor, those who are blind, those who are in need, and that you can do it without recognizing that they can do something for you. The world thinks, what can this person do for me? The followers of the Lord are asking, what can I do for this person? It's a really different mindset. You have to think about this to do it. It's never going to come natural to do this. It has to be the Lord living through us, really. In, in Luke 6, verse 35, Jesus even applies this to enemies. Oh, how we struggle with this. Love your enemies. You're kidding, right, Lord? No, love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. You want to know if you're living this passage? You know, just ask yourself, when was the last time you actually did something for somebody else with no expectation of getting anything in return? Maybe for your kids. I don't know. Maybe. Even there, we expect return, right? I give you this, you're going to be good, right? We have expectations. When was the last time we did for someone without an expectation of return? Well, like the guy who went to the doctor with his wife. You know, she was going to have surgery. The doctor went through the whole process and he told them what to expect and how the surgery would go and what the recovery time would be like and what everything would be like. And then he asked her, are there any questions? And the guy says, yeah, I just have one question. How long before she can resume housework? Sound like us? I think we look at that and we say, yeah, I know others who would be like that, but not me. But of course it would be us. If we could, I don't know, if we could unscrew the top of our heart, you know, and just and, 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 and get and look down inside of it the way God sees it. The way God sees it. Not the way we would realize it, but the way God would see it. I think we would be absolutely appalled at the amount of selfishness that we find there. We'd be appalled. It's, it invades every corner of our existence. Selfishness. And even the selflessness that we might find there, we would very quickly realize is being done in a, with a grudging attitude. Some way we think of it in terms of duty, it's not being done in a loving attitude because we're Pharisees at heart. That's our natural condition. That's why it seems so strange to see someone actually practicing a selfless lifestyle. For those of you, this is for those of you who think nothing good can come out of L.A. I, I'm sure I've heard that many times since I've come to Colorado, especially when I talk about the Dodgers. So let me talk about the Dodgers. Let me tell you about Clayton Kershaw. Most of you know that Clayton Kershaw has developed in one of the best young pitchers in baseball at a very young age. He's passionate about his career and about his work, and he works hard to achieve the success that he's had. But what you may not know is that Clayton and his wife, Ellen, are also devout believers who are committed to living out their faith 
His wife, Ellen, interestingly enough, uh, somewhere in her very young age, I think like age 12 or something like that, she, de she really developed this burden for uh, children in Africa who were underprivileged. And by the age of, eight, of 19, she made a big trip over there all on her own, no parents, uh, nobody she knew, some group that she wasn't familiar with because she was that keen on understanding what was going on and finding ways that she might be able to help. In her case, it doesn't always happen this way, but in her case, Lord gave her a husband who became a multimillionaire at a very young age and began to share her passion for that. And they not only give, but they are, are, are intimately involved in some work going on over there uh, trying to help these underprivileged children. Well, a couple of years ago, at the end of the season, a teammate who is also a believer was shocked when he found out that Clayton and Ellen were going to spend the first two weeks of the new year over in Africa, working with these children. So he says, here's what he says. He says, I, I knew of Ellen's passion for missions and the impact it had on her life and spiritual growth, but I couldn't help but think, come on, really, Kirsch? Off season is the peak training season for baseball players and there would be no place for him to throw or to work out in the middle of Africa. So he went to Kershaw and he said, listen, our season rides on you. What are you doing going to Africa? Well, you should be getting ready for the season. And Kershaw told him, listen, we want, to be, we want to be known, we should be known as Christians who happen to play baseball, not as ball players, who just happen to be Christian. That's a good attitude. That's someone who is at least learning how to put this into practice. There are a couple who are passionate and they're passionate about the right things in the right order as at least in this instance. Can't speak for their whole life, but in this instance, they're inviting the poor and the lame and the blind to the table. Do you see that? Now, beloved, we don't, we, don't have to, you don't have, we don't have to be multimillionaires to do this, right? There are ways to do this. We as believers, we as Christians who call ourselves by the name of Christ should be the ones who are befriending the outcasts. We should be the ones who are different in the sense that we're loving the shy and the misfits and those who are unlovely, those that other people, you know, just don't really want to be around. We can do that in the name of Christ. And we need to be the ones who are doing that. It doesn't take a fortune. That's the prescription that Jesus gives here. Be on the lookout. For those that you can serve without expectation of return. Now then there's a promise that attaches to this in verse 14. Supernatural, supernatural, supernatural satisfaction. The, the reward of God in your life. Do you want that? I mean, I think sometimes we talk about the reward of God in our life and it seems so far away, so, I don't know. The old, as you get to be my age, it won't seem quite so far away, but I think for many of us it does. And, and so it's easy to kind of overlook it. It's easier to live for now. But look what he says in verse 14. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. I mean, that's a great promise. We those we reach out to may not be able to reciprocate. But the Father in heaven can. Do you see that? That's what he's aiming at here. He's saying, I know the people that I'm asking you to reach out to, the blind, the poor, the whatever, are not going to be able to pay you back. But I know somebody who can. I know the Father in heaven can, and I know you do this with the right attitude. The Father in heaven will. You can never really lose, although it may look like it from this life's perspective. You may have friends asking, why are you doing that? How silly is that? You don't get anything for doing that. God will repay. Poor and handicapped people, as we've mentioned in that culture, would have never been invited to these banquets because they could not reciprocate. But look at that little phrase tucked away there in verse 15. He tells us to invite the poor and crippled and you will be blessed because 
Look at that. You will be blessed because they cannot repay you. It's a, it's, a, it's a causative clause that he uses there, meaning the reason you will be blessed is because they can't repay you. For the very reason that they are unable to do anything for you, the Father will. <coughs> That's powerful, is it not? The Lord will repay when those that you are serving cannot. And look at the last phrase. How will you be repaid? Look at it. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. That's not the only way. But what he's saying there is if you, if, if, to, to show yourself a true believer, you do these things, you're going to be resurrected with those who are just, with those who are righteous before God. In other words, you be part of the kingdom of God. This is a promise of heaven. Why? Because you work to get there? No, because your works show that you've given your life and faith to Christ. Eternal reward. So what Jesus really puts in front of us is this, two choices. We will be living our life, serving others for what they can do for us now in this 30 or 40 years or whatever it is that we have left of this life. Is that, is that how we're going to live for now? We live our lives looking for ways to serve others, to serve our Lord with the promise of eternal reward, laying up treasure in heaven, investing in eternity. How far ahead can you see? James 1 27 instructs this way. He says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, he really does in that passage mean orphans and widows, but he's also meaning beyond that anyone who can't pay you back anybody who can't reciprocate, anybody who you get nothing from when you visit them in their affliction, when you help them out with their needs. Anyone like that. And then he says, you, you do that, you keep yourself unstained from the world. What does unstained from the world means? It means from the attitude that looks only to the here and now, the selfish attitudes that it do only for what they can get back. I want you to be like that. That's not how Jesus is. That's not how we are to be. I'm grateful, Philip, and I can look around our church and I can call out name after name of people that I know are already doing this. We need more. We should be more, right? We can do more. I can do more. We all fail to be what we can be in this regard. But Jesus says it this way. He says, this is the way to lay up treasures for yourself in heaven. Do you have any treasure laid up in heaven? You can have. There's a, a great book I came across some time ago called The Three Edwards. Thomas Costain wrote it. It's kind of a history. It tells about a 14th ruler in, 14th century ruler in Belgium named Reynald, R-A-Y-N-A-L-D. I suspect it's short for, it's, it's another version of Reinhold. I don't really know that, but uh, his name was Reynold, but his nickname was Crassus, which is Latin for fat. That will give you some idea what he looked like, I suspect. He was obese. His brother Edward overthrew his throne eventually, younger brother. But rather than kill Reynold, he was very clever. He, built a new, he had a new castle called Newkirk at the time, and he built a room specially for his brother. They got the room all ready, then he forced his brother into the room, and then they built the outer, the outer wall, and particularly the doorway around him. And, the, and then he told his brother, you're free to go whenever you want to. The problem was his brother couldn't fit through any doorway or through any window. These old timers had some good ways of, you know, making their point, right? So, so he told his brother, you can get out anytime you can. And then every day he left some of the most sumptuous food you can imagine in the doorway, right? And poor old Reynold, he could never bring himself to leave it alone. He just ate himself on, into oblivion. 
He was in there for, I think, don't, don't quote me on this, but I think it was 10 years that he was in there before his brother finally was defeated in battle. And he eventually got out, but he was in such poor shape that within a year he died. Instant gratification took, took precedence over any ability to see beyond the immediate. So the pleasure that he got out of the immediate food drove his life, imprisoned him. Jesus would say, I think, as he did in Luke 12, 21, so is the one who lays up for himself treasure on earth and is not rich toward God. You know, a lot of reward for the Christian comes later. It's, it's not totally that way, but those who mislead us and tell us that you come to Christ and everything in your life's going to get straightened out and everything's going to be good and you're going to have all the money you need, you're going to have relationships that are all going to clear up. Those have, you know, that it's, what, what, what did Jesus really promise his disciples? Just, he said to them, you've watched my life. You know how they've persecuted me. Why would you expect anything different? You are going to be persecuted as my followers. You're going to have trouble in this life. That was the main promise Jesus made. Having said that, can a Christian have real joy in their life? Of course. They belong to God. Why wouldn't you have joy? But so much of what we believe will be the reward of the Christian existence comes later. So often, we won't wait for that, though. We live lives that are tied up with what we can get here and now. Can't delay the gratification. And thus we imprison ourselves like Reynolds did in a vacuous existence that leads to great regret as the end of our physical life draws near and we begin to look back on it and say, oh, I've wasted it. I don't know about you, but I can look back on much of my life and say, Whoa, I, how did I waste that time, those opportunities, those decisions. The good news is, beloved, we can, from this day forward, be different people, have lives that are turned over to the Lord. I know we could no more do this perfectly in ourselves than we can fly, but that's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus died. That's why he invites every sinner who cannot repay him in any way to come to the banquet. And he invites us to come and to be forgiven of every sin, of every wasteful thought and attitude and decision and, and whatever we've ever done, to be forgiven of all of that, to have it taken away and removed. That's what Jesus is trying to get the Pharisees to do that are at this banquet. We're all invited to the banquet. We can all come. And then the motivation for our life going forward is to live selflessly as Jesus did. What does he say in Luke 9, 23? If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. He's saying you die to self. That sounds pretty awful and pretty tough, right? But, but we forget, he says, but you can live to me. My life will become yours. My life is way better than yours. You're not giving up something to get nothing. You're giving up pretty small nothing to get everything. Come after me. Who do you want to be? Napoleon? Napoleon invited the rich to his parties. He lived out his selfish agenda. We all know that. Whatever food he wanted, whatever women he wanted, whatever he wanted he could have. For 10 years, he was the ruler of all of, all of Europe. Ten, ten glorious years. Ten years. Think back ten years ago and it's all over. But he had ten years. And then the British defeated him and he, and he was exiled to the, to the island of St. Helena where he lived out his last six years. It was not a good end. His wife, Mary Louise, never wrote him, never communicated with him. In fact, she married another man while he was still living. He never heard from his son again. Everywhere he went, a British soldier went with him, followed him. At the end, on his tombstone, it reads, here lies. That's it. Here lies. 
That's a perfect description of a life lived for self because when the physical life is over with, guess what? It's just here lies. There's nothing else. There's no reward. Anything you worked for, that you lived for, that you wanted, that you got as a reward is over with. Here lies. The end of a life lived in a selfish indulgence. It was all over when life was over. Contrast that with George Mueller, you know. More than 10,000 orphans in late 19th century London, George Mueller raised, cared for. He cared for them so well that people began to complain that he was raising the poor above their natural status in life. He actually had some politicians trying to undermine his work that way. He did this through five orphanages. And by the, he didn't have any money. He did this without ever soliciting a dime from anyone. It's not like he went from church to church and told horror stories. He prayed the money in, and God brought the money in. I mean, read his biography sometime. It's amazing. Sometimes prayed food onto the table, you know, as the kids were sitting down, and it was never late. It's an amazing story of faith in God. He established 117 schools. This is not so well known. He taught 120,000 young people Christian education. He did this with no expectation of reciprocation, though he was a poor man himself. He amazed um, oh, the guy that uh, began, Hudson Taylor, who began the mission organizations in China, was amazed when he would get these contributions from George Mueller because he knew George Mueller, and he knew George Mueller didn't have any money, and he knew he was trying to raise all these orphans, and he'd get these, he'd get these monthly contributions from from George Mueller, totally blew him away. But how could Mueller do this? Here's what Mueller said. Listen to this carefully. He said, there was a day when I died, utterly died to George Mueller, his opinions, preferences, tastes, and will. Died to the world, its approval or censure, die to the approval or blame even of my brethren and friends. And since then I have studied only to show myself approved unto God. There's no telling what God can do with someone who will die to self and come alive to him. So have you died with Christ and been raised to new life in him? You're invited you're invited to the banquet. Jesus has paid the price. I mean, who would you rather be, Napoleon or Mueller? Let me tell you, 100 years from now, beloved, we'll all wish that we had come to the banquet ourselves and we'll wish we had invited others to come along. The poor, the lame, the blind. That we had been willing to serve as selflessly as we can with Christ living through us. To serve self is to, provide, is to produce efforts that will last only as long as we do. Serving Jesus will produce results that will last eternally. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these promises. Thank you for the challenge that this scripture presents to us. To be those who are serving, who are serving, who are thinking of others and who are thinking of you. I pray as we come to the conclusion of this service that we will, in fact, uh, be those as, Lord, this is as good a time as any as we, as we think about a new year to think what will be different for me this year. And I'm not talking about resolutions, Lord, but I'm, I'm talking about a turn in our life from one type of lifestyle to another, to one that says, you know what? What the Lord wants is more important than what I want. What the Lord desires for me is more important than what I desire for me. Where the Lord would want me to serve is more important than where I think I can serve. And to give selflessly to others is in fact the way to have the Lord's favor in my life. Not because we can work our way to him, but because he's already given us everything we could ever hope for. And this would be just one indication of our love for him. So I pray that our motives would be pure, 
that our hearts would be clean before you. Father, I confess my own, you know my failures in this area. You know the selfishness that resides in my own life. I pray that you'll continue as you are, as I know you are, to remove it because I know you know that my heart is toward you. My actions are not always. So I ask for your forgiveness and I ask for your help. I pray that you will impress this upon us. Lord, as we sing this song now, that we would become a servant. Let it be the true prayer of our heart as we close our service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.